Um, so copies. All right, so I mentioned earlier, 60% of the data IDC says is from the copies, right? So we have to worry about copies, right? So lots and lots of copies. Um, if you think about SAP shops um, and classic SAP, if you think about Epic, if you think about Oracle databases, you just think about any type of database. Um, everything, almost every production database has a development database, sometimes a QA database, sometimes many QA databases, sometimes integrity checking for the application, all sorts of copies, right? So it's, you pick your copy, it's certainly a ton of them. All right, so one of the things that we do, and I mentioned, for example, uh, one of the customers uh, making the pricing application, making lots of copies, is uh, an excellent use case of Extreme IO. Uh, I'll give you another example. So another one of our, one of our customers uh, is a, uh, they're running SAP uh, and they're running uh, DW. Um, so they're basically going off and looking at logistics and they're figuring <coughs> out um, the logistics uh, across parts logistics. Uh, in the past, uh, that took them um, about uh, three days to run. Uh, ideally, they wanted to run it in less than a day. Uh, it ran in about four hours in Extreme IO. Uh, and they were able to do it off a copy. Uh, so in running Extreme IO, uh, as V will tell, talk a little bit later, um, Extreme IO volumes and snapshots are exactly the same. There's no performance difference. There's no difference between them. They, they still do, they basically do metadata updates as you're doing it, you know, from a, that, that standpoint. Um, there's absolutely no performance difference at all uh, between um, volumes and snapshots. So let's kind of take some examples here, right? So this is some data. This is from X1, by the way. Uh, I collected this data before um, the GA of uh, X2. Uh, we have about 1.5 million uh, XBC snapshots. Over half of them are writable, uh, meaning over half of them are doing uh, work. And you might say, well, that, that could just be a copy that nobody's actually using. All right, so here's your interesting data. About 40% of the IOs um, is, uh, is done from a snapshot. So we actually track that as part of our install base work. Um, so about 40% of the IOs are done for things like dev, dev and test, QA, uh, it, uh, integrity checking, right? So if you think of an Epic shop, um, they have a production copy, they have a shadow copy, they have a integrity copy, they have a copy for upgrades. Um, so a lot of those customers run Extreme IO and they, um, and they use those snapshots uh, to go ahead and, and deploy across the environment. Do you track the lifetime of them? Do you track the lifetime of them? Uh, some of them are very short, right? So they're measured in hours. Uh, we have customers that keep them for six months. Um, I will tell you, if you look at a distribution curve, you know, the distribution curve is zero to seven days. Um, there's a pretty big drop off then, uh, and there's another decent drop off at 30 days. Uh, but we do have some that keep them out, you know, keep them out for six months longer than that. And, and we're assuming a lot of this IO is dev and test. And... Uh, not necessarily. Yeah, it could be dev and test. Uh, it can be uh, customers doing integrity checking. Um, but it's doing I.O. across the system without having to pay, uh, without having to pay uh, an extra copy of the database, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, so it's good from a capacity point of view. It gets more, if you look at the IT mantra, it would seem I'm, more do I, more with less. I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you on it. But you know, decent snapshots are also becoming table stakes. I will tell you that Extreme Mod does it differently still um, because of the performance implications. If you'll talk about that, um, and it's the fundamental technology of what we're doing. Uh, from a, a replication point of view. It's how we're making <coughs> replication uh, very useful and, uh, and from a deployment point of view. All right, so let's see. What, what, are, the, what are the configuration maximums of the platform? Yes. Uh, so currently, uh, sna uh, snapshots and volumes, which is treated the same thing, 16,000. Uh, that's not an architecture limit. That's just a testing limit right now. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll intend to, to increase that over time. And in the field, what are the configuration maximums that you see your customers actually nudging up against? Um, so customers will nudge up against that. So we, do, especially if customers are doing replication, uh, they will nudge. They will nudge up against that because we generally, for example, design the replication to get use the most snapshots because that's the best uh, amount of replication points to recover to uh, against the environment. The other thing is we look at is we look at from an individual device standpoint, uh, an individual LUN can have no more than a thousand snapshots. That's the other thing that changed next to both those numbers are doubled from X1 mm. uh, and architecture. It's not a limit. It's just a testing limit for us. What about the maximum number of volumes or the maximum number of fiber channel endpoints that are connected to so the maximum, stream? Or... Yes, yeah, so the maximum of volumes and snapshots is the same thing. Uh, so it's it's 8,000 8, 8, in X1 and 16,000 in X2. Mm -hmm. uh, and the maximum number of, uh, of, of endpoints is 1,000 currently. Yeah, so 1,000 initiators. Uh, so if you think about that, two initiators are host usually means you know, 512 host somewhere there. And what's the maximum volume size that you can have? 
Uh, there is no real maximum volume size. Um, I've created a volume of, that's zero, that's a lot of I've created a four petabyte volume. Um, if we need any more than that, I can go check. I don't remember the exact maximum number. Uh, but remember, it's something interesting in Extreme I.O. is when you create a LUN, it doesn't do anything. A LUN is a construct. Yeah. Right? So it's a little different than a traditional architecture where a LUN means something. Uh, and it actually has things like queuing and it, ha and it gets pushed back through the I.O. subsystem. In Extreme I.O., it's a means of getting data into the system that it gets broken apart. Uh, so there's no penalty to great large LUNs. Uh, additionally, uh, when we look at LUNs, we look at for things like performance characteristics, right? So uh, do you need lots of LUNs, for example, to drive Extreme I.O.? Uh, and the answer is no. Uh, I like our best practices for Oracle are four LUNs for data uh, and, one, and, a log, and a log LUN or two, right? So it's not, you don't need 20 LUNs, you don't need 200 LUNs. You, you, you know, it's basically what, what we're worrying about is OS queuing. From Extreme I.O.'s point of view, we could care less. We can actually get away with one. Uh, if, well, I suppose you also have TCP issues with yeah, the, the, absolutely to break stuff up, right? So. Yep, absolutely, yes. But from the from the inside, and once it gets inside the platform, there's no there's no restriction on it. There's nothing tied to a LUN. It's one of the things that's a little different from Extreme IO than some other platforms. We don't we don't tie things to LUNs. At all. In the earlier session, uh, they were talking about uh, REST API. Yep. Do you guys have a published API yet? Yes, hundred percent of what we can do and the GUI and the command line we can do with the REST API. And if we want to discover that? Rest, there's a REST API guy, um, a guide uh, yeah. available on, at support.emc.com. Okay. And it has a pretty good documentation. On, um, we use that, right? So you earlier asked a question about um, uh, <laughs> management inter interfaces. Yep. For example, Viper Controller uses the REST API. Right. Um, the, um, uh, our Splunk integration, as I remember, uses the REST API. Our uh, integration with Live Optics, which is our platform to collect data, uh, for customer sizing efforts that just launched here uh, this week, uses our REST API to collect data. Um, so that's how we that's how we interact with the box in a programmatic way. Um, are you seeing clients, or are there kits specifically for things like CI/CD tool chains for managing copies to spin up my integration environments and things like that? I'm sorry, I didn't I didn't understand your question. Definitely. On these REST, yeah. are you looking at CI/CD? CI, integration for things like Jenkins. So it's like when I do my automated test run, you spin up the copy of the database off the production, you run your integration test against live um, I don't know, you know? I didn't understand exactly the- Continuous integration, continuous deployment, DevOps types yep. of yeah, workflows DevOps. for Jenkins, for you know, OpenStack, for any yeah. of these other Yeah, we do have a full OpenStack support. So um, we have instantiation of the Cinder driver. Mm -hmm. um, Jenkins support, I'm not personally familiar with. Okay. Um, we do have customers mm -hmm. using this for DevOps. Um, would this be more an EMC code type thing again? Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, that's the, that's that's our integration point into that, and they write okay. the interfaces and they use the REST API to do that, right? So that's 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 our, our 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 fundamental requirement is everything that comes out from a feature point of view has to have a REST API. It last last question on the REST API reason. though. I mean, yep. you guys put out your XML and JSON. Or do you know or do you know? Um, I do not. I don't know okay. the answer for that. Yeah. I'll find out. Okay. Yeah, I apologize. In vSphere 6.5, they have they actually exposed the REST API to you through like a web page. Do you guys have any plans to go that route? Or? Uh, we're considering looking okay. at uh, integrating, back integrating. So right now what we do is integration from the storage platform up to vCenter. Uh, we're looking at perhaps doing it the okay. other way. Other questions? So, good? All right. Let's see here. All right, so um, Vince earlier mentioned a little bit about AppSync. <coughs> um, AppSync comes as part of Extreme IO. You get a you get a starter kit, which gives you twenty copies, twenty mounted copies uh, from a uh, from a deployment standpoint. Um, it's one of the things we're trying to do, right? So part of the integration is as supplying all of the components. So everything I talked about so far today is all part of Extreme IO. It's not an additional uh, added cost item. Um, all the features that we talked about in AppSync is is part of that. Um, so you can do, for example, from a DevOps point of view, right? So if you want to go ahead and um, deploy uh, new copies or refresh uh, QA, for example, that can actually be driven by AppSync. The cool thing about that is it's application integrated, so it's application uh, okay. consistent. Okay, forgive me. What is AppSync? AppSync is a uh, is a pro is a product from Dell EMC. Uh, actually, that, works that much I got. Okay, that works. <laughs> that works across. I see a box. Yeah, yeah, it slide. works across multiple storage products. Extreme Miles one, the VMAX All Flash that Vince talked about earlier is one. The, the, it also works okay. across. Okay. So, so, it, so it's a across. It's a cross platform, platform product toolkit. that that basically looks at primarily databases, things like Oracle, S, uh, Oracle SQL Server, uh, Epic, for example. Yeah, and stuff, and lets you snap. And, yep. Yeah. Yep. And what it does is it actually understands the database, and you, and you don't say, I, "I want to take a snapshot of this database." It figures out 
all okay, the underlying so it's components. It's the application consistency toolkit. It's application yeah. consistency there toolkit, but it's also doing it at a VMware level. So I need to, for example, I might have to integrate with, integrate with VMware yeah. level. Yeah. If I have vPlex in the environment, I might have to integrate with vPlex. Um, it automates that process for you. Okay, I got it. it. Makes it easier. Make sense? Yep. Awesome. All right, so uh, let's see if that's that. Um, all right. So management. Let's talk a little bit about our user interface. Yes, yeah, so no Java. Yoo-hoo. Okay, I, I don't want to use your user interface at all. I want to use VMware's SPBM. What, what's the current state of VVALS and VASA 3 support? We are currently evaluating VVAL support. Evaluating at all? Well, no, we're currently, uh, we, don't have, we currently have, we don't have VVAL support oh, so right like now. Evaluating whether you'll do it or not? We're evaluating the timeline we'll do it. Oh, the timeline. So yeah, it yeah. will be done, we don't know when, That's or we don't yes. want to do it. Okay, thank you. Uh, the usual VVALS problem, chickens and eggs. To an, extent you're, to, to an extent, you're right, right? So one of the things I do uh, is I actually go, every time I talk, I say, how many people are interested in doing VVALS in production? Um, and I will tell you, with the exception of the last three weeks, I usually get one weak hand. Uh, with the last three weeks, I've gotten a couple more stronger hands. Uh, so I think the chicken and egg problem might resolve itself a little bit. Um, Vasa 3.0, uh, the, the, the new features part of the, part of the, make it Part really of the problem is they came out with VVALS 1.0 and let the market assume it would immediately take over when it required a VMware upgrade and a storage upgrade yep. and the storage system you were upgrading to to support VVALS. So that was going to be at least two years. And it had some challenges. Well, v well VASA 2.0 right. was kind of weak. 3.0 is getting there. Yeah, absolutely. It's a journey, right? And so remember, as part of the, the Dell Technologies Federation, uh, we will continue to support our, our partners. Ah, yes, I forgot about the whole. <laughs> the, the Federation got mentioned. I forgot. It. I, oh, no. <laughs> Okay, wait. Federation, drink. <laughs> it used to be the Ipsy Union, now it's the Federation. Yeah. <clears throat> all right. That thing. Yeah, all right. So, uh, <laughs> all right. Let's go talk a little bit about the da about the, the dashboard. Right. So, uh, we're trying to make it as easy as possible to use. Um, you know, health scores. You know, what's going on. So, obviously, this array has some critical errors. Right. We need to might want to drill in and take a look at that. Of course, all that alerting comes home to EMC, uh, as well as to you. Right. So, performance key KPIs, capacity KPIs. Uh, so we want to make that as easy, easy to use as customers. Remember uh, that all we're, everything we're doing is at five second intervals, so it's very granular. Uh, and it's kept for um, in, in, in increasing intervals for two years uh, on that XMS. Again, can I yes, push this into vRealize operations? You can push data out. Yes, absolutely. That's actually REST API is how we drive and pull that data out. OK. Yep, so we, we pull that data. You can actually put it in Splunk uh, if you want to. Uh, you can put it into all sorts of, you know, basically we publish all the, the polling from this can be pulled, all the data can be pulled and put wherever you want. So we actually drive that that way. So, right, so we're trying to make it as easy as possible, right? So create volumes. We could care less what the size is. So we have no heritage. Remember, volumes are just a construct to get data. Uh, we can create whatever you want from a size point of view. You can change it whenever you want. And no, to answer the question, no, you can't shrink because we don't like getting rid of data. Um, we can create initiator groups, groups of hosts, and we map volumes. Pretty simple, right? One, two, three. Very simple. Um, tags, right? So if you're a Gmail fan at all, uh, we kind of modeled this feature based on uh, tags, uh, Gmail tags, and it allows us to go ahead and, and we can use this, for example, this can come from their REST API as well. So if you want to tag groups of volumes or groups of hosts across the environment um, and do reporting against that, you can go ahead and do so. Uh, you can do it in our GUI, you can do it in the REST API, you can do it with the CLI uh, as well. Um, so it makes it it's easier for us humans to understand uh, than, uh, than other things. And, and one object can have multiple tags? Of course, sir. Yes. Was that just for reporting? Can you use it for configuration and things like that as well? You can use it for configuration, so, yep. Okay. And actually, you can use it for things like snapshots as well. So it's one of the reasons, one of the ways we can, you, if you want to, you can actually figure out what the latest snapshot is by putting the, ta the latest tag on it. So what happens when you have a, an object which, you, which has several tags yes. and you're uh, applying a configuration change which, will, which might negatively impact one of these uh, tags, for example? Let's say you've tagged it production and you've mistakenly tagged it also development or something like that. And you're making a change on the development tag, which might have some downstream impact on production. It depends on the changes. So for example, if your change was I was going to unmap, I'm going to tell you, it tells you exactly here are the servers I'm going to unmap. Mm -hmm. Right? So it, it tells you, here's what I'm going to do. Are you okay. sure that you want to do that? OK. Right? If, you're, if your thing is deleting data, right? for example, we won't allow you to delete a volume until it's been unmapped from a host. We have a concept called management protection. If it's been management unprotected as well, it has to be out of a consistency group. It has to be clean, for example, before the data okay. can be deleted. So we don't, yeah, we, we, we actually thought about that and we want to make sure things, some things that are destructive, we try to make them yeah, you have not to easy to do. So you don't, mm -hmm. you protect against an oops. 
All right, so searching is kind of easy. Uh, so if you want to search by NAA, volumes, tags, we can go ahead and do that. Kind of makes it easy to find things uh, in the environment. Um, one of the things we added next to in the GUI was the ability to guide a workflow. After you create a volume, what might you want to do? You might want to add another host. You might want to add to an existing host. You want to add to a consistency group. We kind of guide you through. And basically comes down at the bottom saying, all right, you have created a volume. We're all good. Where everything's happy. We want to add something. We kind of try to guide you through that process. Make it easier, easier to use. So I'm going to kind of skip through this. Uh, so reports. So here's, here's a couple things I find pretty interesting uh, from a reporting point of view. So this one, I think, is actually something that I've been looking for for a while. Um, and it was all about patterns, right? So one of the things that is challenging is when are things busy, when are they not? And most importantly, when are they different than they used to be? So our weekly patterns allows us to do that. We keep basically uh, uh, eight weeks back. So we're looking at, in this case, this is an eight-week average. And this could be a cluster. It could be a group of volumes. It could be an initiated group. And then what you do is you can click this change button here, which I can't do in, in, because this is not a live system. Uh, it'll actually tell you the percentage difference for the latest configuration. Does your REST API export that data? Yep. The REST, the REST API exports the, 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 the data. Now you have to make the patterns. Well, because obviously if I want to use that, that data in and of itself means nothing unless I can correlate with something else from some other platform like my vCenter or sure. something else. Yeah, so you have all that performance data, and you can, abs you can actually aggregate that together. Uh, but one of the things is if you think of like, well, when's a non-busy time of the system, right? People think you might want to do some work, right? Classically, you think Saturday night. Well, Saturday night is almost never, never uh, it's actually pretty busy for things like backups. Um, and, and, and other interesting things is latency heat map, right? So block sizes by heat map, right? So how am I busy? You know, are my large block IOs, small block IOs, how do they differ? Uh, and then, of course, block distribution, which becomes very important, right? So if, um, in this case, this particular environment has kind of a mix, quite a bit of 16K uh, in this particular environment. Uh, but other environments may be different. And Zavi, you'll talk about a little bit about that. 